Welcome to Film Courage. This is episode 156, and I'm Karen Warden. And I'm David Brandon. Today's guests are brothers Franz and Kurt Wisner. In 1999, Franz Wisner thought he had his whole life mapped out. A careful planner and skillful to-do list maker, he had the car, the house, the promising career path, and eventually the right woman with whom to experience his success, as he had just proposed to his girlfriend. The wedding ceremony was set for a California coastal resort in Sonoma County. 100 plus guests were confirmed, catering was in place, until his fiance backs out about a week before the event. Understandably, Franz is devastated, enlisting the help of his Seattle-based younger brother, Kurt, a recent D4C, he urges Franz to stay with the wedding plans, instead turning it into a party amongst family and friends. Within the same week as his relationship breakup, Franz's lobbying position at the Irvine Company in Orange County, California, a job he knew would be the vessel to channel his pain of newfound bachelorhood through, is severely altered. Franz receives a demotion at work, further crushing his carefully planned life. Franz and Kurt decide to take the Costa Rican honeymoon previously planned for Franz and his fiance. Although the brothers weren't as close as they would have liked and both were in life situations which made them question fulfillment, they decide to sell their homes and other possessions, continuing this honeymoon by traveling to 50 plus countries for two years. While on the road, the brothers interview strangers abroad um, on the meaning of love and life. The result of this experience gave way to the New York Times bestseller, Honeymoon with My Brother, written by Franz and shared through experiences with Kurt. In 2010, Franz released another book outlining lessons from his journey entitled How the World Makes Love and What It Taught a Jilted Groom. Franz and his photographer brother Kurt have appeared on Oprah, The Today Show, CNN, Fox News, and more. Let's now welcome to the Film Courage studio, Franz and Kurt Wisner. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hello, Thanks hello. Thanks so much for being here. That yes. sounds pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do, do we get most of that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know okay. it's, I'll, I know I'll it's a good it. book, but it, it sounds like a good movie, too. <laughs> awesome. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. You can follow these guys on Twitter, at Franz Wisner and at Kurt Wisner, although Kurt said he's not, much, not, he's not big on tweeting. And if you're compelled by their story as, as much as we are, uh, don't be afraid to send them some love. We also encourage you you to learn more about them by visiting honeymoonwithmybrother.com and howtheworldmakeslove.com. Well, again, welcome, gentlemen, and thanks so much for being here. What a fantastic story, and I know it happened about, what, 10 years ago or a little yeah. more? Okay. Yeah, right at 10 years ago. Okay. And de definitely not how I thought my honeymoon would go. Uh, you're 100% correct that I was a big planner. I made these lists every day, and then literally within the span of a week, I get left at the altar and dumped at my job as well. And so it's this double whammy that really hit me. Um, <laughs> although I should say it was a triple whammy because <laughs> after going into my boss's office at the company and how he explained that, hey, you know, we've done some reorganizing here, you know. Right. Um, you used to be at the top of the pyramid, now you're at the bottom of the pyramid. I'm thinking, uh oh. Bad luck comes in threes, right? It mm -hmm. always does. Yeah. Right, so right. I go back to my office, and there's a woman in there, and she's measuring my couch. And I had this beautiful black leather couch, office overlooking the Pacific Ocean in Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. And I said, what are you doing? And she says, oh, it's n not going to fit in your new office. And I thought, ah, there's my third, right? So in the span of a week, okay. not only did I get dumped at the altar and dumped at my work, um, I also lost a really beautiful black leather couch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, and, that's and the one. wonderful view, I guess, Yeah, as well, And the right? wonderful view. Jeez. So they, it was after that that I was, I was driving home, and Kurt, my brother, was staying with me for a little bit just to make sure I didn't go off the deep end. And I had this idea on the drive home. I, I came, came in the door, and I said, Hey, Kurt, you know, I'd just like to go on a honeymoon. And he said, with whom? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I said, I've got, you know, two weeks in Costa Rica. I've got the, you know, the honeymoon suites. I got champagne. I've got flowers. And he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Honeymoon suites have one bed. <laughs> and oftentimes it's heart shaped. <laughs> and I love you. I want to help you. <laughs> but there ain't no way I'm going to spend two weeks in Costa Rica in a heart shaped bed with you. So I said, ah, no, don't worry about it. And um, we'll all sleep on the floor. And we we took off in what was going to be two weeks in Costa Rica, and, and um, 
yeah, the, the, we got some funny looks down there because we booked this big honeymoon package, and you know they they take honeymoons very seriously in Costa Rica, a big deal. And so we'd go to these resorts, and the guy would be standing out front, and he'd say, "Mister and Mister, <laughs> was, where, where's Mrs. Wisner? I don't." And we tell, now she got cold feet. <laughs> okay. And so, but it was it was good for us in that you know we had drifted apart. We weren't very close he lived in seattle um i lived in southern california and we just didn't see each other a lot we didn't speak to each other by phone a lot and we just like so many brothers and sisters you you know you kind of go to college you start a family somewhere else you just drift apart and that certainly was us and so it was during this two weeks we had you know such a good time having those conversations that brothers should have and clearing our heads and reevaluating life that that's when we decided to extend the two weeks into two years in 53 countries i want to backtrack just for a sec though you grew up uh in davis california mm-hmm. is that right okay right. Northern and california what was what was that like i mean i think i've driven through davis it's near sacramento and nice it, town it's a it's mm-hmm. a lovely town and it's a great place to grow up it's the it's the kind of place where as a child uh, you can get on your bike and your parents let you go away for the whole day as long as you're home by dinner. So it's not as today's society where it's so hands-on watching your kids and, and everything's so protective. Davis was a very, um, you know, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Okay, so I, you could trust your neighbors and things like that. Oh, definitely. Uh-huh. And, and another element to this about growing up in Davis is that our, our parents took us on sabbaticals. And our our father is a retired physician, and his group had a little sabbatical program. So growing up, we lived in New Zealand for a while, and we lived in Australia for a while. And as kids, I, I'm, we're such huge proponents of taking your kids on the road, getting them out there, because I, you know, for us at a very early age, we realized, hey, you know, the world is much more similar than dissimilar. That you can have fun anywhere, um, and make friends anywhere, and and the road is is wonderful and something to be embraced, not this frightening thing to avoid. Mm. Okay. So those seeds were planted uh, many, many years prior. Okay. And you both went to college where? I uh, attended the <laughs> University of Oregon in uh, Eugene, Oregon. Go Ducks. Yeah, go Ducks. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm a Tufts Jumbo alumni. Yeah, Tufts. Well, I think you mentioned, too, that your parents were very supportive of you, but they also had expectations they wanted you on the right career path. What was your initial goal, either in college or out of college? Well, I was I, I worked very heavily in government and politics and um, in public relations. But it, you know, it was starting to get burned out on that. I mean, it's a very uh, all-consuming profession. Um, I, I equate it to the it, it's kind of the opposite of travel in that. Politics is all about dividing, right? Drawing lines. You're with us, you're against us. You're pro this, you're anti this. Um, whereas travel is is about erasing lines. You know, you go to a country and you meet someone, and the first thing you do is you talk about what you have in common, not what you have um, apart. Mm. And so, you know that that definitely frays on you, and it's a much I'm I'm much better emotional state when when I'm embracing and traveling than I was in government. And Kurt, what about for you? What were your plans for after college? Did you envision anything like this? Did you have a set goal? Well, uh, I'm a typical second born. So Franz is the first born planner type A, has his whole career set. <laughs> Me, I didn't I know. It. I had no plans. So okay. I kind of... Uh, Musician then? Yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> You have this, is it 1999, you have the wedding plan? Is that the right Had the wedding plan, okay. right? So, unfortunately... Sea Ranch, California. Beautiful place, right on the Sonoma Coast, like you mentioned. Um, but it's also one of these places that it's it's remote, and that's what keeps it beautiful, but you need to you know ship the flowers in from somewhere, and the food in, and the wine in, and so <laughs> you need to make plans well in advance if you're going to have a wedding up there. So, w- so, so when, <laughs> when uh, Annie dumped him, uh, you know, just days before the wedding, we started making these phone calls. I told Franz, hey, we got to start trying to recoup some of this money and tell all these people they don't need to go. And the responses we received from the people we called were, you know what? I got the kids out of school. We've got the house rented up there. We're actually going anyway. So <laughs> it was just a matter of me convincing Franz that he should be there as well. And 
it, he was uh, he wasn't for it at first, but he finally came around, and it turned out to be a very I think it was a weird weekend for you, but oh, a it was surreal. Range of it was emotions. surreal, and uh, of of 150 people that were invited, 75 showed up. So my side of the aisle, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we drank every ounce of the wine, ate every ounce of the food, um, and yeah, every emotion possible i think was going through my head you know i was confused i was heartbroken i was angry i was suspicious um a little bit relieved on some levels um also drunk and broke yeah <laughs> right so the party is over i'm mm-hmm. sure you you know you probably have people consoling you and and saying you know you're going to find love again what happens once everybody leaves i mean where does the initial sort of yeah. chaos of the weekend wear off and then you yes. go okay this is my life where am i going now i, I I think with any setback and, and trauma, that's that's usually the case. Um, friends rally around immediately, but then you know you get into your routines and, and the phone calls you know drop off a little bit and the visits drop off and, and but you're stuck with this pain and so I it did it it I cycled through a lot of emotions and then got to. Um, more of a, a sad place, a depressed place, and um, that's why when we decided to go on this honeymoon and then to extend <laughs> this honeymoon, man, that's a great way to keep your mind off of you know anything that's that's wrong in your life, um, and to start focusing on on others and learning about the world and stop you know feeling so sorry for yourself. And you know, some people go to a, a counselor for help. You know, our, we went to the world. You know. Some people need a world of help. That's that's us. We need a world of help. Right. And Kurt, you had been through some painful things earlier in your life, and without going into them too much, how are you able to be there for your brother? I, I know you mentioned, too, that you weren't as close as you would have liked growing up, but how are you able to kind of be there for him emotionally, physically? Well, here, here's this brother who I, you know, I've idolized all throughout all of his achievements in college and in his career. My mom would send me articles about all these great things that he's done, and <laughs> and so to to see his life come crumbling down around him, I just I, you know, just the the brotherly instinct came out in me, and it just I had mm. to be there for him, and and uh, you know, and then it was it was it, it made a whole lot of sense for us to extend that initial trip to Costa Rica because. You know, like you mentioned, the, some of the stuff I was going through in my life, just gotten out of divorce and not super happy with my job up in Seattle. So mm-hmm. uh, it made perfect sense for us to extend this travel and, uh, you know, I wouldn't trade it for the world. You know, when the bottom was taken out from underneath you, uh, Franz, you know, how, how long did it take you to, to regain your confidence? Because obviously you're, you're distracting yourself. You're, you're in mm-hmm. Costa Rica mm-hmm. and, and then you're going through this. But I have to imagine it took quite a while before you felt like, you know what, I'm finally me again. It did. And um, we started dating on the road, not not each other. Uh, I started. <laughs> hey, whoa, I, whoa. That's I, another. Point. Yeah, I, <laughs> no, I started dating you know women in, in different countries and Kurt, you know as well. Um, every envy of every man. There. <laughs> and uh, it, but the at first, and I write about this in the book a lot, and and. Um, they're they're kind of awkward and they're fumbles and they're <laughs> there's nothing romantic about uh these situations on the road and uh until you know we we got to Brazil and then I met somebody who I thought was pretty cool and um she was wonderful and and um I th- thought I was going to lose my honeymoon partner <laughs> right. for a little bit there mm-hmm. but uh and and it was never one of these things it was going to be uh, a long-term marriage but it was it was a neat friendship that developed and she was very helpful brazil as a country is a wonderful country um for a number of reasons it's it's a great i think anybody who gets divorced or goes through a breakup should book that first plane down to brazil there you go (laughs) and uh (laughs) and enjoy some of that joie de vivre it's just such a warm and open place i mean even you land in the airport and the first thing you hear they you know most airports have a very you know official sounding voice you know now boarding flight number one two in brazil it's this you know very famous woman uh who purrs and so she says you know now boarding you know <laughs> Varigui, flight number 124 to sao paulo and it, it puts you like in the it, mood like it. right away right away that's cool 
you know, I also want to talk about your leap of faith, you know, because when, mm-hmm. when you're selling your house, you're selling your stocks and, and pretty much all you own, mm-hmm. you know, did you really know what you were doing at that time? And not only that, but, you know, you go and you convince Kurt to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is really... <laughs> yeah. You know, n- no is the short answer. Um, the the star of the book and the star of um, our lives at, during that time uh, was a woman named LaRue. And LaRue was our 98-year-old grandmother, step-grandmother, um, who had married our grandfather when she was 80. So she didn't come into our lives um, in, until much later. But she lived in a retirement home. And we went into her, you know, when we were thinking about doing this, and we said, hey, LaRue, guess what? You know, we're going to quit the jobs and give everything away and go on and keep on the honeymoon. And she said, great. She said, do it, you know. She said, "Uh, tell you what, I'll go with you. And we we said, oh, okay, you know, the honeymoon's not really going according to plan anyhow, but, you know, welcome. You you know, come on. She said, no, 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 no. She said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy a map of the world, and I'm going to buy a bunch of red pens, and then you guys send me a postcard, a letter, wherever you go, and then I'll put the pens in the map, Mm -hmm. you know, we'll... We'll follow along. I'll share the postcards with the whole retirement home. We'll go with you. And it was so interesting because to a person, they embraced the trip. They embraced the notion of extended travel. They embraced the notion of doing it when you're young. Um, so many of them said, I wish I could do that now. You know, My brother's already passed away. Um, I don't have the body to do it. I got the time. I got the money. Um, I wish I spent more time with my family. I wish I traveled more when I could do it, you know. Um, And that, you know, really gave us a lot of inspiration. You know, hey, here are these people, you know, high on this mountain of life and with a really clear view of what's important and what isn't important. And not one of them said, you know, don't do it. And so we, we trusted in LaRue and her retirement home and kept the promise, you know, we... Everywhere we went, we'd send them postcards. I still have this big box of postcards. Um, and then we ended the honeymoon at LaRue's 100th birthday and wow. came back and, and had a little celebration. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That's really that's great. Really cool. we, li- we liked her advice better than our parents because they were you know, concerned about the, the, the nitty-gritty stuff of, you know, what are you going to do about insurance and your job and all those wow. kind of things. We didn't. LaRue and her generation you know, could see the... The light at the end of the tunnel there, and you know, you know good advice. And Kurt, how, I mean, how easy was this for you? I mean, you said you hadn't been much of a planner. You know, you looked up to your older brother, and your older brother was like, "This is what I want to do." And I mean, how how easy of a decision was this for you to say, "You know what? I'm I'm all in. I'm going to do this with you." I, I, I like I referenced before, the timing was perfect because here I was, recently divorced, not enjoying my job up in Seattle, so it was just the little nudge I needed as well to to, to go out and see the world and to, to get to know a brother who I had lost contact and with. And you weren't terrified as you're selling your house and you're just like... Sure. Uh, you know, I think it, any any of those big life-changing decisions, um, and, you know, we're going to make you pause for a second thought, but no, looking back, it was the, definitely the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. There's this great scene uh, when you talk about getting rid of everything. <laughs> we had a garage sale. And you know, basically just to give stuff away, you know. Um, and <laughs> Kurt put the ad out in the newspaper, uh, but he didn't He didn't say no early birds, which we learned if you don't <laughs> clearly specify no early birds. <laughs> no early birds. They will come and knock on your door <laughs> at like four in the morning. <laughs> I remember <laughs> this guy comes and knocks on the door and he's, you know, silverware? Do you have any? <laughs> and, uh, or there was that lady in the... As I'm walking back to my room, there was a um, lady in the window, and she kind of knocks, and she's like, "Antiques, antiques!" <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, so we had this crazy scene where you know we're just basically giving stuff away. You know, you want a chair? All right, you know, twenty five cents. You know, Kurt sold his old wedding photo. Um, you know, the the enormous kind. You know, the big as a fireplace. Uh, he sold it to a woman for a dollar. And the only reason why she bought it is because her son was getting married, and she just wanted the frame for her son's wedding photo. So she she buys it, and then she starts ripping the photo out of the frame. 
And Kurt's like, no, 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 no. You got to take the whole thing. You know, I'm giving it to you for a buck. You know, come on. <laughs> so, yeah. we. And then. That was very know, liberating. Though. Yeah. The, yeah. Very liberating. The, um, oh, all the, the, you know, people, you know, gardeners and, you know, like the mailman and anybody who was in the neighborhood kind of sees this free for all. And so they start backing up trucks and we're just like loading in, you know, all the stuff that doesn't matter at all. And, yeah, that was a neat feeling at the end of that day. You, my whole life had been about accumulation, and you know, you get one car, and then you want immediately want the next car, and, and you, you know, buy a house, and you think about a bigger house, and it's you never satisfied. That ne- that never ends. You know, people who make ten, you know, million dollars want to make twenty million dollars, and mm-hmm. enter it. Um, but when you start going the other way, it's as addictive as materialism um you you know i remember we did a a run to salvation army and we packed up all these boxes and i remember dropping it off and thinking immediately what next you know what else can we can we give away and so we went you know back and did another load and and you get addicted in that and that's that feels great because at the end of that process that you feel so strong you know you feel so alive that you have zero material possessions that hold you down that weigh you down um you know all the no car payment no home no mortgage no no cell phone no pager no (laughs) bills no nothing is you feel human i mean could you literally feel the weight come off your shoulders Mm -hmm. yes yeah wow i want to go back to a 2005 article in the LA Times mm. and I believe the writer quotes an acquaintance of yours mm-hmm. saying that their journey became the subject of awe and envy I'd love to do the same but only if I'm daydreaming a lot of people I suspect lived vicariously through Franz saying secretly to themselves I wish I had the stones to do something <laughs> like that I'm cleaning it up here if I weren't married I mean I'd shuck it all down to the car house job everything and be able to do that but very few people are willing to hit the eject button. Now, as things have changed drastically in the economy, people's homes have lost value, their stocks have lost value, are people coming up to you now even more so saying, I wish I had done this? Well, I, I would put myself in that category, oh, okay. too. I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't. I was not the guy to do it. You know, I it, had I just been dumped at the altar, I would have poured all my energies into my job. And had I just been you know dumped at my job, I would have poured all my energies into my relationship. But it was really this double whammy that forced me to go out on the road. And it, I mean, it was it was so <laughs> it was such a strong blow. Um, these two pillars, the two pillars of my life crashing that that only then did I start thinking, wait a minute, you know, maybe there's, this isn't the path that I'm supposed to be on. And maybe there's another path for me. And, and literally the road just opened up at that point. And I, you know, still having these tickets to go on the honeymoon and only, you know, I, I, I wish I was, you know, brave enough to do it. Um, but the the truth is I wasn't. I was pushed in it. And, you know, I, I would have gotten married. I would have. I wasn't the one who said, you know what, this doesn't feel right. Um, you get a lot of the sympathy when you're the dumpy, but a lot of times the dumper is the one who, you know, has, has more of the stones, as you say. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, God bless her for, for dumping me. It was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Mm. What would you say to people, for the two of you, that are facing similar things in their lives? I mean, so many people have just had their lives uprooted. What would you talk to them about in terms of letting go? Because I think we all have this vision of what our lives are supposed to look like, especially by a certain age. And yeah, if it, you know. it, it's difficult. I think, you know, Franz made reference to it earlier about the power of travel as therapy. And um, we get a, a lot of really lovely emails from folks for a variety of reasons, but a lot of them hit along the hit on the lines of that the the our book and our story has inspired them to take a trip, whether they've gone through a tough breakup or something, some tragedy in their life, and and have used our story, story as as uh, you know evidence that you can do it. And um, <laughs> we had these one these two guys from sorry from uh, <laughs> Tulsa, Oklahoma, sending these the emails. We sold the truck. 
we, 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 we canceled the lease on our apartment. We're going to Costa Rica. We're going to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> And then, like, we checked back with them a month later. They didn't do it. But, <laughs> didn't do it. but I was, but I was fired up for them, yeah. 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 You know, I was thinking about your guys' story yesterday. And, and what I, I was just doing this for fun. I was kind of taking your story, and then I was replacing Franz with, like, other people that we know. Mm. And, and just trying to imagine, like, their success in, in your place. And, and, and in many cases, it didn't work. You know, like, for instance, you take George Clooney, you plug that into place, and, like, yes, you, you can see that working with George Clooney, but then if you take someone like Jonah Hill, you put him in this place of the honeymoon with my brother, it's like, you know what, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's the right casting. That, that story's not going to work. Um, have you thought about that at all in terms of um, – that, that honeymoon with my brother kind of gives you both sort of the perfect story. It's a story that fits both you guys. And then in terms of all of us, what can we do to hone in on what our story is mm-hmm. that maybe would attract and appeal to other people? Well, I think it's, it, it's, it is universal. That everybody dreams of escape. I mean, not everybody dreams about taking a two-year honeymoon with the brother, although if anybody is dreaming that, you know, my brother is here and he's available for a honeymoon. He packs light and he's got all of his shots and a good passport. And, um, but yeah, no, we, we all have that, that escape dream, you know, and, and it, it really comes in when you've had a crummy day or you, you know, you and your loved one are, are in a tough situation or, you know things are bad at work you know we all dream about being on that beach or or you know and and so i think some of the stories like this like you know under the tuscan sun or honeymoon or um eat pray love they they do tap into something that we all think about um it's just not all of us act on it and yet you know i'm a big proponent of of breaking away even if it's for a weekend or you know taking a you know a couple weeks off from work or doing just changing up your routine um i think i think you know that that goes a long way towards um you know convincing yourself that that you know hey i'm 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 not stuck in a rut you know my life isn't set i still have control over this thing um and i think travel is a really really good way to do that we you know we were talking earlier about you know one of the huge regions you know why people should travel is just the time to think you know you realize how much of your life is is dominated by bills and emails and you know cell phone calls and and silly stuff stuff that doesn't matter at all and and it's not until you know break away from that and you get out into some remote places and you unplug and you detach that your brain starts to to kick in and ask yourself some you know pretty basic questions about life you know like what do i want to do with it you know what 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 makes me happy what you know what what doesn't make me happy what am i looking for in a partner what do i what are my goals you know i it was shocking to me that it it wasn't until we got to the far ends of the world that i even started asking myself these questions and i'm like holy smokes i've you know i've been out of college you know for 10 years and i've never asked you know what i wanted to do when i grew up I just kind of went from one job to another, but it's not like I was so in love with those jobs. How have your personal relationships been affected? You know, because we, we've observed with higher profile people that the people around them can sometimes have a hard time with that success. You know, however they perceive it. In essence, you know, they they sort of feel like you know what you you've taken my shot. You know, I, I don't know what it is about human nature, but that that you know. But have you guys experienced this in terms of before honeymoon with my brother? The relationships that you had and then afterward, you know, maybe the way that, you know, people close to you perceived you and what was happening with you guys? Not not really. The I would say, though, not not the the book doing well, um, but there were d- definitely some, you know, friends that I had before, you know, taking the honeymoon that I'm not as close with today. And, and conversely, others um, that I'm much closer to, I your priorities change, and so I think you're you you shift towards friends with similar priorities. I, I remember I I used to work um, at a PR firm, and there was a guy there named Mike Deaver. Mike Deaver used to be the chief of staff to Ronald Reagan, and and at one time held one of the most powerful jobs on the planet, literally. And then 
he left and uh, he got in all kinds of legal trouble for lobbying the White House. Uh, he was an alcoholic. He almost lost his family. His health was failing. Um, he was being sued. He was, you know, being a, he was tried on a bunch of charges. And so he, he literally went from the, like the highest point <laughs> to, to the absolute lowest point. And I remember talking to him, you know, years later when we were both working for the same firm. And this is the guy I always respected and, and, and idolized. And I remember him telling me about the importance of getting kicked on your ass, the importance of falling down. And he said, you know, one of the key things in that is that you learn who's with you and who's not with you. And he said it was so interesting to him when he went through all of his legal troubles that the first people that called were not who he thought would call. You know, one of the first calls he got was from Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House and a guy that he had, you know, fought against for all of these years. He's like, Tip O'Neill. He's like, I woke up every day trying to make Tip O'Neill's life hell. And Tip O'Neill called and said, whatever you need, I'll, I'll do it for you. Mm. And conversely, there were some people on his staff that never talked to him and, and f- fled and didn't want anything to do with him. And he's like, that's great, you know. That's great because I know where I know where I stand, you know, mm. and I know I know who's with me and who's not, and I you know we didn't go through it to that level, but you know I do think I used to have this really high powered job where I I gave out millions of dollars to politicians and they would come to the office and it was great for my ego you know because they would come and you know tell me you know how wonderful I was and and you know could they please have a check and. I'd say sure, and I'd write him a check, and you know, obviously <laughs> they don't call me anymore. You know, I haven't, <laughs> so I'm not as uh, close with with that set. Um, and thank God. <laughs> Anything to add? No, I think that you know another fun thing about our success with the story and everything is is how it's uh, affected our parents. They really, you know, at first they were very apprehensive about these two brothers are we losing these guys do we have to go out and bring them back (laughs) put them in some real jobs again but um through the success of the book and the stories and all the the joy it's brought them um you know they really have they really get a kick out of it especially in the small town of davis california they you know these are my brothers these are my sons and they're very proud of us so that's great oh very cool that's great we are currently in the studio with Franz Wisner and Kurt Wisner. Some more of their work is available by visiting honeymoonwithmybrother.com and howtheworldmakeslove.com. About your travels, you, yeah. you have said that the focus was on getting enriched rather than getting mm-hmm. rich. You know, and you two have traveled for two years initially in a honeymoon with my brother, and then we found out that you guys traveled for an additional three years after that. Mm-hmm. Um, let me let me see. So. Um, when you did return home, how much of the world had really changed? A lot. Uh, we we started the the trip, the honeymoon, and it still sounds funny to say that. Uh, but we started the honeymoon, you know, pre nine eleven, and then you know nine eleven um, took place, and and yeah, there was this moment where we thought, you know, do we go on? Um, you know, do we stop the honeymoon here? And and did some soul searching and, and eventually decided to keep going and that, you know, if there was any time that the world needed greater dialogue, needed greater connectivity, it was then. And so wanted to, to keep going and learning um, and embracing and and did that. And it wasn't until the very end of the honeymoon that I even thought about doing a book and it was about the time when you know our our money was running out and we needed to get back and uh, I got it actually got an offer to go back to my old firm and they're like hey you know even we dusted off your old couch you know you can (laughs) come on (laughs) back it's an Ikea couch (laughs) (laughs) and I just you know the money was good and and the comfort it would have been an easy job and situation to go back to but it didn't feel right and I knew I wanted to keep traveling and I knew I wanted to do something with Kurt and I and you know I had tasted this freedom and I didn't want to give it back and so throughout the honeymoon I'd I'd written a lot of um, essays that kind of found their way into newspapers and magazines and 
I, I told people, you know, don't, I don't want to be paid for this because I don't want it to feel like a job. I don't, you know, just clean up my spelling, you know, take out the swear words and, and you're free to use whatever you want. And so these were all about. Fr- fr- I mean, when you say they just happen to find their way, <laughs> right. help, well, help me here. How, well, how, how do they just find their way? <laughs> I had, I, I started doing these things for friends and a lot of my friends were in media mm-hmm. and, and I had a lot of friends who were reporters and, they would email me and say, "Hey, I read that you know essay you wrote about the world's worst cab driver, you know, or mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, the cult of the backpackers, or things you." Re- I'd always write about people because mm-hmm. right? that's what's interesting about the planet. Um, and so they would send it on to like the the travel editor at the San Francisco Chronicle, and so I'd get an email from him saying, "Hey, you know, your friend Deborah sent me this article, um, and I'd like to run it." Nice. Yeah. So yeah, that was great, um, but I it was the first time in my career that I wrote for me. I, I, I I've been a writer for a long time, but um, you know, speech writer, press secretary, that sort of writing, which in is is easy, but it's it's not as as rewarding. Um, and so it wasn't until the very end that we decided to to try to sell this as a book. So I took all those essays including one that I wrote called Honeymoon with My Brother. Because a lot of people would come up to us on the road and say, hey, you know, you guys on vacation? And we'd say, no, we're actually on my honeymoon. <laughs> and then they'd look at Kurt and they're like, what happened? <laughs> and so we, I, in this essay, I explained that, you know, I'm on, a, I'm on a honeymoon and I haven't had one complaint about my spooning techniques <laughs> and I haven't set foot into one expensive shopping boutique. It's because a funny thing happened to me on the way to the altar. And did a did a book proposal and sent it out to all the the big publishers in New York and promptly got rejected by every single one of them, you know, with some really, you know, <laughs> goofy responses saying things like, you know, interesting story, not the guy to write it. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> who who else? <laughs> if you want Kurt to write it, he can write it, you know. But that. Other than the two of us, you know, who else was on the honeymoon? Well, you got one that said the niche is too crowded. Yeah, the right? niche yeah. is too crowded. I uh, <laughs> that was crazy to me because I, I to this day I, they don't know what niche it goes in. I mean, we're in Barnes and Noble, we're in in memoir, um, in a lot of bookstores, we're in travel, in some bookstores, um, we're just in nonfiction. In in Borders, rest in peace. Uh, we were in self help. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah. Interesting. Next to Doc, you know, dec- next to Doctor Phil and Doctor Ruth. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, I, it was the woman who eventually uh, signed you. Mm-hmm. It was at St. Martin's. Didn't yeah. her son? Didn't something similar just happen to him? You're you're hundred percent right. That okay. She had just had uh, a, she had a seventeen year old son who'd just been dumped, and this was the first love in this kid's life. And she said, all of these emotions came pouring out of him that she didn't even know existed, and she said it was like having a, a person inside come out and she said i was i was fascinated and and i wanted to give him a hug and i and i wanted to learn more and i she said and your proposal hit my desk that day mm. and at which point kurt said god bless your son <laughs> and i was like no 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 god bless the woman who dumped your son right. <laughs> because she she bought it and they spent very little money on it um, but it didn't matter. It was a good excuse to to keep traveling and to and to keep writing. So I spent a year writing the book, and you know, I started out. I thought it was going to be more of a travel log. But it, you know, as in the writing process, when you're you're open to it, as you guys know, these things have a life of their own, and and certain storylines and characters pull you and and rise up in importance, and others you know, repel you and they tend to fade away. And so, yeah, it, it, during that process, it evolved a, a lot from a, a travel log more into a brother bonding story, um, a story about, you know, our relationship with LaRue, our grandmother, our, our story about the relationship with the world. Um, th- those were the, the bigger themes that, that started emerging. 
I want to talk about the movie deal, and sure. we're all running out of time, but I just have to ask you, just from going on the site and seeing these wonderful book clubs of these very <laughs> supportive <laughs> fans, they're all women, and I can see mm. why. You both are very handsome and, and charming, and I can see why they'd be intrigued. But what do men say about this? Because it, it, I'm sure not a lot of men are willing to open up about something as personal as this, and we've, we've seen that they're taught not to. So what do men say about this book? Well, uh, you, you do. You mentioned the the pictures of the the book clubs, and yes, the book clubs out there are are they're the ones who have driven the book and and made it so successful. But I think uh, you know a lot of women reading the book in in bed and and chuckling and laughing or crying, and their husband saying, "What are you reading?" <laughs> and they'd be like, "Well, I think you'll enjoy this book too." And so um, you know, it, uh, men men definitely enjoy it as well, and I think that they gravitate towards some of the things we talked about earlier in the escape. Um, okay. And that kind of stuff. Right, because so much pressure is put on men to be a breadwinner and, and status and things. And, yeah. and, the, and the women uh, really enjoy Franz's his writing, but also um, hearing a man's feelings and, and, and you know, yeah. and as much as he put into that, into the story. Oh, very cool. Okay, so the film. The movie. The movie. Let's yeah. Well, so the book, I mean, it's a layup, right? Yeah. I mean, what, what, what do you want? It's an original story? Yeah. You know, the, the, book, the book came out and... Um, it started to do fantastic. Actually, I should step back and, and say that we sold it actually before the book came out. We sold it. Um, our agent put it out on a Friday, and we sold it after a crazy bidding war on Monday to Sony Pictures and uh, Mosaic Media. And they bought it as a big, broad-based comedy for Jim Carrey and Wolf Ferrell. And they bought it basically as Dumb and Dumber. And they bought it without <laughs> reading the book, and they just thought, "Oh, what a, what a great setup for a movie! This could be, you know, these two goofy brothers going around the world." Um, and and you know, we thought, "All right, you know, that that's fine as long as I love Dumb and Dumber. I think it's a great movie. Um, I love <laughs> planes, trains, and automobiles. Um, it, you know, we just wanted a gazillion people to go see the movie, and a gazillion people to come out of the movie and say, you know, hey, that was great, and you know, we should read the book. <laughs> the book's." Because the book was what we controlled, and we knew, you know, the process that, um, you know, it's it's once you sell it, it's in their hands. Um, but but we thought that they would make a good movie. Well, and in fact, when we sold it, they said, "I'm shocked that nobody's invented this story," you know. Um, and in fact, since our book's been out, it, there have been like similar scenes in in uh, movies where people have been oh. dumped at the altar, and so we. You know, we we take pride in that. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, so we uh, we then went out and and sold the book and and went on the road and and met with any book club that would meet us. We'd we'd go and we'd you know go to their hometown and we loaded up Kurt's VW van and we did a four month tour around the country, just with invites and and thirty different states and it was beautiful, great and and uh, a real grassroots campaign that that propelled this book onto the New York Times bestseller list. And so we meanwhile, I think the, the Sony and Mosaic were really struggling with what kind of a movie to make. They, they bought it as a, a broad-based comedy, a gag-driven movie. And when then they started reading the book and they started reading about people like LaRue and and our characters um and as the the producer told me at the time, he's like, "Hey, you know, I I bought it on title alone, but he's like, there's a lot of there there, and now I'm kind of confused, and I don't think they ever solved that confusion. And you, it split people into two camps. There was one camp that said broad-based comedy, Dumb and Dumber, Planes, Trains. There was another camp that said, no, 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 heartfelt, you know, character-driven movie. Low, um, can, there'll be funny moments, obviously, but something a, a little a little deeper and i think the advice that they gave the writer was you know split the difference and he tried to split the difference and as you guys know it never works to split the difference mm -hmm. and so in the end nobody was happy with the scripts and kurt and i at that point said you know you guys thank you um we appreciate all the hard work we'd like to get the rights back and so that took us another year of, of negotiating and waiting and finally got the rights back to the movie. And when was this? Uh, this was Just last year. Just about a year ago, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so 
now we've we've taken a, a much different approach on it. Um, it's kind of like you know you gave your baby to a school <laughs> and they didn't take great care of your baby, so now you're a little more protective of your baby. And now we're much you know more interested um, in doing something that that we're a little more involved in and that it feels right. You know the when we tell people on the road. Hey, you know this? They bought this movie for Jim Carrey and Will Ferrell. There was unanimous groan from the the book clubs. You know, our our core, our support out there. Um, they didn't they didn't love that at all. They they wanted you know a much uh, a much more thoughtful movie. Mm-hmm. And and you know, so did we. So we've we've just started working with the writer. Actually, the the writer um, her name's uh, Cami Delavine and Cami. Uh, actually lives in my building in Brooklyn. I live in Brooklyn now. And she wrote Blue Valentine, oh, cool. um, mm. which was a great movie and, and, you know, really struck some amazing chords. And, and so we're just now starting this, this process anew and, and, you know, just working on a, a treatment that she just completed. And, and we're just now starting to talk to people you know who who want to get involved, and what really what we're looking for are people who love it as much as we do, and and who you know are dedicated to it, and and want to give it that TLC. You know, here's what we're not interested in, is anybody who said, oh, you know that movie sold to Sony, and so it's not hot anymore. You know, that, <laughs> Hollywood is so fascinated with hot. You know, and I'm like, but what about good? Right. <laughs> you know, we're so if anybody you know brings that up, that's just like a non-starter to us. We're like, you know. Thank you very much. We're just going to keep going on our own way. Mm. Do you think the message is too deep and it might scare what I call the middle class masses? No, because mm. I, I think that those messages can really be simplified. You know, like mm-hmm. everybody dreams of escape, like we were talking about. Everybody dreams about an improved relationship with a family member. Um, you know, these th- these these themes... Um, take place in our lives all day every day um it's just ours was happened to be played out around the world i don't and i don't think we, you know the book isn't a travel log and i you know i don't think the movie should be either the it's just it's a very interesting you know backdrop to a more you know universal theme thank you Thank you. Uh, We've been speaking with Franz and Kurt Wisner. For more on the brothers, please visit honeymoonwithmybrother.com and Franz's latest project, howtheworldmakeslove.com. And we'd like to thank our guy, Ronan Rosner. He's a gentleman you seldom see or hear, but he plays a huge part in what we do. Yeah, our our gratitude. This has been really special having you you guys in the studio. Thank you, guys. And, And thanks very much to your audience. And, yeah, give us a shout. And we we just we're, we're looking forward to seeing the film because we we've been waiting for it and we we wondered yeah. what had happened. Who knows? So maybe when, you when guys will be responsible for putting the wow. team together. Yeah. that yeah. would be quite an honor. Sometimes you just you just put you the put thought you put the thought out there, there. there. and put it out there. Intention, you know? power of intention. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Would you like to hear your project or business mentioned during one of our shows or displayed on our site? To advertise with FilmCourage.com and our radio program, please inquire through FilmCourage.com via our contact page. We'll be here next Sunday on LATalkRadio.com with actor Kevin Chapman. Kevin has been in numerous roles, including as Detective Lionel Fusco on the show Person of Interest, uh, Terrence on Rescue Me, Freddie Cork on Brotherhood. One of my favorites, Sunshine Cleaning as Carl, uh, Ladder, Ladder 49, um, Boondock Saints. I mean, it goes on and on. For more information on Kevin, please visit KevinChapman.com or his IMDb page to see all his credits. And that does it for us, folks. Until next Sunday, have a great week.